Hey folks, we are back with this month's deep dive where we take a look at movies that uh, deserve a little more of an investigation, good or bad. And I am your host, Jeff Galishaw. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Andre Joseph. And being that it's Black History Month, we have decided to take a look back at a movie uh, that is of African-American interest, or was at least aimed at an African-American audience. And we are going to take a look at the Chris Rock action movie, Bad Company. Um the title pretty much says it all. This is a movie where Chris Rock uh, stars as this street hustler and his twin brother who works for the CIA. But when his brother who works for the CIA gets killed, they need uh, to find Chris Rock's street hustler character and train him uh, in a short amount of time to impersonate his brother so that they can broker this deal with this terrorist so that they can take him down. And who's going to train him and is in charge of all of this? Sir Anthony Hopkins, of course. And, uh, at, you know, actor extraordinaire and action film extraordinaire, <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. Unfortunately, we do not get to see him do any hand-to-hand combat in this film. Um... The film also co-stars Kerry Washington, Peter Stomare, because why not? It's a Jerry Bruckheimer film, uh, and Brooke Smith, Garcelle Beauvais, because, you know, it's an African-American movie, and she must play either the beauty, love interest, or girlfriend. Um, and we have, again, Mr. Anthony Hopkins. Uh, let's see, who else do I have? Oh, we have John Slattery. Yeah, John and- Slattery. As a CIA boss, Daniel Sunjata, who mm-hmm. some of you might know from Rescue Me, Irma P. Hall, P. Hall who always plays old, angry black ladies as his mama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have, and also Gabriel Mott, for those of you who were fans of SWAT, the movie. <laughs> he is in this movie. And it is directed by the legendary Joel Schumacher. <laughs> And as I said, it's produced by Jerry Bruckheimer. Um, Andre, tell me your recollections of first seeing or even hearing about this film. Mm. Um, I was first hearing about it pretty much online, like a lot of other people back then. And I remember what it was used to be called Black Sheep. Yes. And I thought right away, the Chris Farley movie, and they actually changed the name because of it. So they changed it to another title that had been used 8 million times, like the one with Lawrence Fishburne, which we should do a deep dive on one day. Oh, I um, prefer not. <laughs> so as i remember it was supposed to come out in december 2001 and got delayed because of 9 yeah. 11 and mm-hmm. i was disappointed and i was a little hyped for this movie because it read like beverly hills cop meets enemy of the state with this potentially being chris rock's beverly hills cop level vehicle and when it finally came out i remember seeing it pretty much after a bad night that i had and i saw it with my dad and i remember actually enjoying it in the theater wow. on later viewings of course <laughs> i realized okay maybe this isn't as good as i remember it being um it's one of those movies where they thought the concept was going to be so cool that it was going to hook people in that you know chris rock doing an action role and you're going to put it with the most unlikely person because that's what you do back in those days when you do a buddy movie you put two people that are the total opposites of each other and you have some magic there's no magic here <laughs> anthony hopkins is a wonderful actor he's an oscar-winning actor but he is not an action guy why would the cia the american cia hire an old british man to mentor a black kid off the street and actually he wasn't a kid you i mean chris rock was already pushing 40 at that time so you know why would they even say that he's like a young 20 something year old and i sorry i don't buy the idea of chris rock's twin who dies being the super smart guy i think he should have just made it just a regular brother why does it have to be a twin he twists some things up just because oh they're supposed to look alike um it has the feel of everything that you would expect in a jerry bruckheimer movie taking a guy who's totally out of their depth 
putting them in an environment that they have to ultimately adjust to and then becoming a hero at the end of the story with all kinds of action and technology and you know the Trevor Rabin music that they like to use the Hans Zimmer type stuff it's formulatic and it doesn't even feel like a Joel Schumacher movie it feels like Joel Schumacher just got paid to just do Jerry Bruckheimer's bidding um I don't think it's flat out terrible. It's got enjoyable stuff in it, but it's definitely not good. It's not Bad Boys. It's not Beverly Hills Cop. It definitely is not Enemy of the State. Oh, no, no, no. And um, I think it's like how you said. I think it's a movie you will enjoy if you're watching it with a bunch of people. Just, you know, if you just need something to watch. But I don't think it's a movie like you really particular is anybody's favorite. I mean, even Anthony Hopkins admitted he knew it was bad. Yeah. But his agent told him he needed to be in a blockbuster. So this is what he meant. And, you know, um, it's interesting him and Brooke Smith, who was also in Silence of the Lambs, so they have a mini reunion, even though they had no scenes in Silence of the Lambs together. My major, my major problem with this film is, like you said, it was supposed to be Chris Rock's Beverly Hills Cop, but this film kind of exposes, at least at the time, how limited of an actor Chris Rock is. Yeah. Like, with his stand-up, he's hilarious. But again, it's more of a thinking man's, you know, like, kind of stand-up. And in this movie, he's supposed to be more of a man of action. But, you know, he's more of a cerebral person. And it, it also comes out in his performance. He's not a very physical actor. So him having to play, you know, an action movie, it just seems like he's kind of stiff. And even I remember the poster with him, like, walking away from an explosion with the gun. It was just like... Yeah, this ain't gonna work, <laughs> you know. And as you said, like, I wonder, I know we have the Simpson Bruckheimer style, but do you think more or less, like, when it comes to Michael Bay, he perfectly encompasses the Bruckheimer style when not it when it not being a Bruckheimer film? Do you who do you think more influenced each other? Did Bay style influence Bruckheimer or did Bruckheimer influence Michael Bay style? I would say Bay influenced uh, Bruckheimer, but I actually I would go a little further than that. I would say Tony Scott, because if you look at Top Gun and Beverly Hills Cop 2, that style did technically carry over into like what Michael Bay did in Bad Boys, you know, with the orange filters, the MTV style of the camera work and the editing. Before Top Gun, you didn't really see that. I mean, Adrian Lyne with Flashdance had already like this style with the smoky images and mm -hmm. the lights and the red light setups that he did. And the first Beverly Hills Cop was very cut and dry. They used Clint Eastwood's DP for that movie. So I think once Tony Scott came in, that everything had to be MTV looking. And then Bay took it the next step. And then next thing you know, Simon West and yes, uh, Joel Schumacher here with Bad Company, even Dylan Bilal with the third Bad Boys movie all followed that same mold. Yeah, because like one of the things, well, I always thought that Michael Bay brought is like these kind of, like quick shots of like just like let's say a dancing girl or a certain object yeah. you know that looks cool and it seems like this is all over this movie so that you wouldn't even if you didn't see the credits you wouldn't even think joel schumacher directed this film you'd be like oh michael bay must have made it yeah. except for you know, lack of twenty thousand explosions and so but like this film it just the problem with it is just that you want to like it, but it seems to let you down scene right. by scene. Even like, okay, you have Garcelle Beauvais. That is like his brother's girlfriend. And, you know, not to, I'm not trying to diss Carrie Washington, but her character is just so like minor and just so, I guess, plain that when yeah. it's like, you know, you'd be like, I think he would more go for the Garcelle Beauvais character. <laughs> and then, no, no, Bruckheimer. I like Peter Stomare too. Stop making him villains or the main villain. You know, we're so used to him doing that same thing. It seems like the only thing that changes about his villains in different movie is uh, the danger they possess and what color shades he's going to wear. 
in particular movies because that's the only thing that changes in this movie. And maybe he's not as off the wall as his other villains are in other movies. But still, it's like almost like this is this performance is familiar. And like I said, it's it's no shock that this originally started off as a sequel script to Blue Streak. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't know how they were going to work in the twin angle with Martin Lawrence from the first movie. But OK, mm-hmm. you know, and the worst part is, <laughs> don't quote me on this. I think Blue Streak's a little more enjoyable than this movie. I agree, yeah. You know, I'm like, and I like Chris Rock, you know, and I'm just like, yo, this movie is so disappointing. I know, I know a lot of people are like, why the hell did you pick this movie? But it's just because I just want to show, like, this is what Hollywood was offering him and hyping him up to be, and it was something obvious he was not ready for i don't think he would ever be ready for just because he was in lethal weapon four doesn't mean oh he's ready to be an action hero now and it not only fails the audience but it kind of fails him it kind of fails everybody i mean anthony hopkins came through on skate he's like hey i got two oscars i don't give a fuck (laughs) you know but everybody else it was like oh this is like like why it just felt it felt like a filler movie like, you know, we need something to come out, even though it was supposed to come out in December, it's like, this feels like a summer filler movie. Like, we need something. So, Brooke Iron's like, hey, I got this script. And it was like, hey, Joel Schumacher's like, I need money. <laughs> and Chris Rock's like, I want to be an action star. <laughs> and Anthony Hopkins like, my agent made me take this. And Peter Stamari's like, yeah, whatever, okay. <laughs> You know, and Garcelle Beauvais like, I'm happy to be on the big screen. <laughs> so it's like all these actors coming together. Like, if you really, this is this is how bad this movie is. I'm going to go with dream casting for this movie. <laughs> you know who would have been interesting as the villain? Who? John Lovitz. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> you wouldn't see it coming, would you? <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> John Lovitz is a terrorist. <laughs> Exactly. You're so used to this guy being a bozo, and it's like, yo, this motherfucker is dangerous. Hey, he was good in happiness playing a semi-dramatic depressing role. So <laughs> why could he not work? Let's not forget, he wasn't Mr. Destiny in more of a in a dramatic role. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you don't okay, since you don't want to go with Love It, there's always my favorite filler, James Belushi. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, even though he didn't play a Russian in Red Heat, he finally gets his chance here. Yeah, but he's played serial killers and rapists and other movies, too. But, I mean... He he played with Tupac. (laughs) I I saw (laughs) gang-related, too. Um, But, I mean, this would be his chance to shine. I mean, he'd be buried in a big-budget movie, but at least it's like a big-budget Jerry Bruckheimer film, you know? I I, I want to go back to Chris Rock here for a second because this is the other problem I think the film has and it's Chris Rock also in general too he has the same problem that Richard Pryor had when he was doing movies where as a stand-up comedian he is an icon there is nobody that touches those guys there there are the pillars of comedy and they're up there you try to write a script for them it's hard to capture that same energy, no matter how good of a director you have, or if you think you have like a genius script. And one of the problems I've had with Chris Rock's movies, pretty much for that period, it was just lifting his material from those comedies, those stand-up routines, and just inject them into the dialogue. You see it in Down to Earth, you see it in Head of State, you see it here in Bad Company. And it's like, okay, I've heard this joke. Give me something new. Give me something different and exciting. And when you do get something new, it's as cliched as him being a DJ, which I don't know why they made him a DJ and a hustler in the street. And he's playing the air supply music because he's depressed his girlfriend left him. Or the whole bit about him in the diner with Anthony Hopkins. And he's like, oh, no, you don't tell me to go into the car. You're supposed to be like, get in the car, bitch. Like, uh, maybe it's funny for a second, but then they try to overextend the joke with Andy Hopkins actually trying to do it himself and it doesn't come off right. It comes off awkward. So when they start throwing that stuff and like the hip hop references he likes to do, 
it just doesn't play. It doesn't make me chuckle or roll down the aisle laughing. It's just there. And then on, on top of all this action and suspense and making it, you know, almost on the edge of being an R-rated movie, which this is not, it's a PG-13, but it's like trying to juxtapose like all this other crazy stuff going on with the humor. And they're trying to think of doing bad boys. It doesn't play. Well, uh, well, it's interesting what you said about recycling jokes because he does recycle a joke from CB4 in this movie mm-hmm. about hey, if they cook a pig's ass, uh, yeah, right? I'll eat it or something like that. But and you I'm know, like, did he suggest those jokes or did they say, oh, do that thing? Come on, Chris, you know, do your stand-up routine like like a bunch of minstrel people. Uh, it, it, unfortunately, that's what it feels like with this film because, like as you were saying with Chris Rock, another problem. I have with Chris Rock and his acting sometimes. It's like, hey, he played the hell out of Pookie in mm-hmm. New Jack City. But every, like, not I'm not going to say every film, but a lot of his films, it feels like he's acting. It doesn't yeah. feel like he's inhabiting the role. It always feels like, okay, in this scene, I'm supposed to do this. In this scene, I'm supposed to do this. Especially anytime he's supposed to scream. I'm like, no! <laughs> you know, that's how it comes off when you watch him act. Oh my God. And then this is the other problem I have with this movie. So the third act, they're supposed to try to stop this bomb from going off in Manhattan. Like it's like a nuclear bomb. So originally they, they shot this in World Trade, then they reshot it for obvious reasons. But it's like there's all this panic and craziness in a typical Bruckheimer third act of like everybody's scrambling to try to stop this thing. Just like at the end of the rock when they're trying to stop the chemical bomb from going off in uh, Alcatraz. Why the fuck are you still cracking jokes trying to stop a bomb in the last 30 minutes of the movie? At that point, it's all got to stop. This is a serious situation here. And you've got Anthony Hopkins, like, cracking jokes and, like, almost, like, he's, like, always starting to shoot Anthony Hopkins to stop the bomb. I don't get it. It's just stop it at that point. It's serious shit. No, this is Chris Rock. He, you know, like even in the third act, he's got to have humor. Same thing with Anthony. Well, if it was a Michael Bay movie, then the humor really would have been misplaced. Um, but it's like, it, but like you said, it's like, it just feels like everything in this movie is a pitch. You're like, hey, wouldn't it be funny? If Anthony Hopkins said, get in the car, bitch, because he's a Shakespearean actor yeah. and we're not used to hearing him say things like that. Well, you the know, when it, they're doing the car chase and he said something about, oh, you're like James Bond, you do the shooting. Or it's like, wait, where is the correlation between James Bond and Anthony Hopkins? I don't see, I know he did a movie where he played a secret agent once and it was a TV movie with Lindsay Wagner, but there's nothing in his filmography that makes me think, he, put Sean Connery in this movie and it would have made money. He would have had chemistry with Chris Rock. Fuck Anthony <laughs> Hopkins. Damn, why why you gotta be pick on Anthony Hopkins? He just wanted to make his paycheck. He the money to do this shit. He doesn't have to, but shit. If your agent says being a blockbuster, this is what you pick. Hey, and if you can't get Connery, get Michael Caine. No, I'd rather <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. Fuck Michael. Look at a Harry Palmer movie. People will buy that. What if they would have got Gene Hackman for this? <laughs> he would have came out of retirement. Been like, Enemy of the State Part 2. Gene Hackman <laughs> with the English accent? He doesn't have... It could have just been Gene Hackman with his regular speaking voice. It still would have been like, huh? It's still better than... It would still be better than Behind Enemy Lines. <laughs> it's okay. And I'm just saying, uh, you know... Oh, the behind-the-scenes stories for that. <laughs> It's like, yes, Gene Hackman count. It's like in that Kevin Smith movie, JSI Live Bob Strike Back, where you just see Gus Van Sant counting money. And that's <laughs> what Gene Hackman was doing on the set of Behind Enemy Life. He probably doesn't even remember co starring in the Royal Tenenbaums with Owen Wilson. He's like, Who's this blonde kid? Why does he keep talking to me? <laughs> But see, the difference is, if Gene Hackman had been in Bad Company, you can still believe at his age, him kicking ass. Oh, yeah. You know, you believe, okay, John Slade's like, yes, we'll get Hackman to train Chris Rock. Whereas with Anthony Hopkins, it's like, huh? It's, you know, 
That would be like, I'm trying to think of somebody. I don't know when Russell Brand was a thing in movies. Like, let's get Russell Brand to train somebody. Like, even if he was in a Johnny English movie. And, wow, that was an obscure reference. Yeah. <laughs> well, fuck Russell or, Brand, too. Or, no, it, it, nobody would even know who he was. What if Rowan Atkinson played the role instead of Anthony Hopkins? I would have liked to have seen that. He would have made that gold. It would have made it extremely strange. Like, here's two, <laughs> here's two comedians in an action movie, you know? But and see none Rowan of- Atkinson try to play straight? That would have been cool. I think Rowan Atkinson could be believable being straight. But again, I would have probably rather cast him as the villain, if anything. Like, <laughs> let's Rowan Atkinson be scary. <laughs> you know? And a Russian scary guy. Yeah, but if you Laurie can do it, why not Rowan Atkinson? Then what's wrong with you, Laurie? Big? He was a and comedian she, too before he started yeah, but, playing House. Yes, yeah, but see, to me, Hugh Laurie has more of a scary look to him. You know, more but than women find Hugh Laurie sexy. There's a lot. Women find a lot of people sexy. That's not fair. <laughs> they used to find James Gandolfini sexy. <laughs> it's true that that is true and some even found mark Furman sexy before they found out he was a rapist. <laughs> so, so i'm you like way off base i'm just saying you said they found him sexy i'm just pointing out extreme levels of men women used to find sexy you hey you're not confusing mark Furman with mark Harmon. no no mark Harmon still looks good <laughs> he's like He's like John Stamos, <laughs> you know, who would have also been a good pick for a villain in this movie. <laughs> I'm like, okay, maybe not as hard as Mark Furman, but remember when women thought Corbin Burnson was sexy until he lost his hair? Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, I remember. Shit, they even played that up in um, Kiss Kiss Bang yeah, Bang. <laughs> so, I'm like, or again. Since we're picking people from the past, Val Kilmer in Anthony Hopkins' role. <laughs> Not the done dream. that though. But who was he wackily partnered with? <laughs> oh, the, the Indian guy from Thunder Heart. <laughs> oh no, no, that was supposed to be a dramatic role. But I'm like, you know, my thing is, I it's just like this was. That's the problem with this movie. It's obviously meant. For Chris Rock, but all the roles are so interchangeable <laughs> that nobody makes a mark in it. Yeah. You know, you know. Unfortunately, it's more all on Chris Rock's shoulders because they were trying to hype him up. I mean, he's more believable in Spiral than he is in this movie. <laughs> I mean, he works best in something like I think I Love My Wife and Top Ten, which he or Top Five, I think it was called. Yeah, Top Five, which yeah. he writes and directs. Right and, when he does his own material, except for Head of State. It works, but when somebody else tries to write for him, I like to have it play. Is, hey, I, 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 as a person who liked Head of State, I uh, take that personally. It's but very I very dated. It is a dated movie. Hey, that's not his fault. Vo- oh. <laughs> hey, at the time it was popping. <laughs> so, but you get you don't know how things are gonna age. But either way, those are like Chris Rock. I enjoy more when he uh, is doing his own material because it's just like I could have picked down to earth we would still be talking about the same problems right. where they don't know how to use him and that he's supposed to play a stand-up comedian and it's still weird you know and, and I remember like he always said in one of his interviews like they would send him scripts where like oh this is different than your stereotypical this is more in tune with your voice and then it was the script for Marcy X no oh god yeah yeah i heard that story yeah so it's like stuff like that so i'm glad he kind of took control of his career and he tried to do something different with spiral but obviously like bad company we've gone all over the place oh, with this god yeah <laughs> well, that shows you how you know messy this film is in general you know it's like a jerry springer episode <laughs> you know it's just like all over the place it needed a but, mcdonald's promotion to be successful Oh God! I, how would you, how would you do a McDonald's? What do you get? Like, hey, 
I got twin Chris Rocks with my heavy belt. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I got Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> oh, I got a Garcelle Bouvet. <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a drink, too. Look, uh, well, hey, that's her name. I can't yeah, help it. Let me get a Garcelle Bouvet, please. <laughs> it sounds delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, this could have been like, give it five years. This could have starred Jamie Foxx. And, and it would have been a better I, movie with Jamie Foxx. Yeah, because surprisingly, Bait was actually decent. What? And, that movie sucked. I, it was better than this. <laughs> that had a dramatic third act that just like, it was a comedy and all of a sudden it got violent. It needed to. <laughs> it had Mike Epps in it. <laughs> you know, okay, we're, we're done. We're done. <laughs> Look, Doug Hutchinson is more memorable as a villain than <laughs> Peter Stamari was. Okay. Oh God, we are like totally crossing into all these movies. Hey, it is Black History Month, and these all are black movies. So, but yeah, I would. Unfortunately, this is like a major failure. I'm not talking about the episode. I'm talking about the movie. <laughs> um, any last lingering thoughts about Bad Company? Mm, the I Chris think, Rock <laughs> I think we covered everything. We should do the Lawrence Fishburne movie next. No, I'm never sitting through that movie again. <laughs> so, and maybe one day. If I do, I'm drinking. <laughs> I'm watching it. You mean the tool shed originally? <laughs> Yes, I know about that movie, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, that ends our business for this week. Um, but we always have more unfinished business to be uh, done and done, told. Basically, any movie is better than this movie to really suggest. Yeah. I'm like, but hmm, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be nice. Have you seen The Woodsman with Kevin Bacon? If not, why not? Because it's fucking awesome. Uh, have you seen Dear White People? If not, why not? It's fucking awesome. Yeah, you all should. And um, and that ends this week's very messy episode. <laughs> Talk 